This is HR in Review, a podcast dedicated to HR thought leadership, actionable advice and all the latest developments in human resource management. Welcome to another episode of the HR in Review podcast. I'm your guest host today, Bill Bannum, And in this episode, we're going to delve into the relationships that HR pros have with group benefit brokers and ways that leaders can get more from their investments, plus how group benefits help to ensure a happy workforce. And I'm delighted to say that today joining me is Roger Thorpe, who is the founder of Thorpe Benefits. Roger, welcome to the HR in Review pod. Okay, thanks, Bill. Thanks for having me. I'm looking forward to having this this fresh conversation. From a UK perspective, this is going to be very interesting for, I think, your audience to hear. Absolutely. So um, we're going to give you a bit of a Canadian perspective, listeners, today on, on, mm-hmm. on group benefits. Obviously, there'll be lots of lessons which you can take away and use in your organizations if you are in the UK. But yeah, we wanted to do a bit of a different take today. So, uh, Roger, beyond my wee introduction there, why don't you start by telling our listeners a wee bit about yourself and also about Thought Benefits? Sure. Well, uh, I've been in this industry for uh, over 25 years, started very early out of university, focused on the employee benefit. Uh, space. So joined a family practice actually at the time in the uh, late 90s and then slowly started buying into that company, taking it over and really rebranding it as a specialty business. So um, I've really become and have been a specialist in employee benefits and then further in added the uh, component of employee health and wellness to that. So it's been great to focus really on my career on doing one thing really well and have built a really good team around me. So the evolution really of Thorpe Benefits is we are a company that is hired uh, at a point in a business that as they mature and they hire senior HR and finance positions, those people are tasked to make really good decisions on, on the, for the benefit of the company. So if you can imagine health insurance as a product with smaller companies is often a, a just a, a rate and a renewal exercise. Maybe it's a friend of the owner that puts it in. But at some point, you have to really look at what you're getting from that investment, measure it very deeply, and see what kind of impact you can make. So we are, for a lot of businesses, an upgrade. Just as you would upgrade your IT people, uh, your accounting firm, uh, any advisor to get bigger value, uh, that's why people bring us to the table. So I'm um, pretty proud of being able to focus on one thing and do that extremely well. This edition of HR in Review is a special guest episode brought to you in partnership with our friends at the North American based HR Chat podcast, a podcast focused on interviews with HR, talent, and tech experts. Okay, thank you very much. So, follow up question, I guess, is why? What, what, why, mm-hmm. why are the exclusive? benefit uh, focus on, on benefits and, and as part of that of course wellness initiatives you know why, why is yeah. that the case why, why not have a, um, a broader focus yeah i i guess there are other models out there for hr consulting companies in the world that offer the full suite of compensation hr benefits retirement total rewards but we really have decided that the, the really the client requires best in class in the category of healthcare. Um, you can't afford as a business to hire a generalist and just because they can, you know, be the agent of record on a product, that's really not in the best interest of the business. So we spend all our time and we have great team and resources to bring better value and better attention to that. So it's, I come from a very service-based intuition. The more effort, the more support you give a client, the more you teach them, the better they are. And we can prove that with outcomes with our clients. The other disciplines like compensation and other things, we can bring those to the table and actually choose best in class for the client and help them uh, without bias, uh, also bring in other experts. So that's worked really well for our clients. We become kind of the voice of reason on who they should also partner with outside of Thorpe Benefits. So the wellness part really was a personal passion initially of looking at how health impacts performance And then we looked at that from a corporate standpoint. How does a healthy workplace impact morale, productivity, ultimately business success and competitiveness? And we all know that wellness is becoming the buzzword. It's it's very broad in its scope. It can be very, you know, weak, but it can also be very, very impactful for employees if it's really changing the way they behave. 
So we've got right into the corporate wellness space to understand what actually works, what doesn't, how to you know, build a, a strategy around it um, and take less of a product approach to more of an advice and guidance approach to it. So a lot of companies come to us and say, we wanna start something with wellness, but we wanna do it properly. We, want, we don't wanna be uh, wooed by a particular vendor uh, we want the clarity of your advice first. And then, so I think we filled a very important role. Uh, it's basically changed the role of the broker from just a product or a benefit broker to also a wellness advisor and health advisor. And I think benefit consulting really needs that. The client needs that. So yeah, that's the evolution of, of why we decided to specialize. Okay, and you have loads of conversations with, with with your clients and prospects and partners and all the rest of it all the time. I've, I've seen it happen. I've worked from your office. Mm -hmm. um, are, 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 there, are there any particular trends in benefits that you are talking about with your clients at the moment? And maybe as part of that answer, you can share what a, what a client's struggling with right now and, and how you're mm -hmm. helping them. Yeah, there's a bit of a push and pull issue. Benefits, as you know, is something that employees pretty much expect to have. It's a, it's, it's got to be a checkbox if you think of that as an HR hygiene item, right? Um, but you also need to recognize that every employee has a particular issue that they want to deal with at any particular time. It changes all the time. So benefits is moving from less of a cookie cutter, um, rubber stamped offering to more of a, a combination of core benefits and risk protection to letting the employee follow a path of healthcare that they require. And that is really under the guise of self-care, but also they're looking at solutions in almost like a marketplace approach. So they are able to access product and services that might help them in that moment, whether that's a man managing their diabetes, whether that's managing and living, a, a thriving with a mental illness, um, so really there's a bit of a, an awareness that if an employee needs something, we need to give them what they need in that moment. Uh, and that's uh, about technology. That's about communication. It's also very much about listening to the employee population. So, uh, that's the trend I see is kind of like this individual nature of the employee experience. The struggle of course, is how to do that properly. So clients are caught looking at benefits often as a benchmark. How do we compare with other clients? And if you think about it, benefits changes very slowly. The pandemic changed a lot, especially with um, digital solutions, telemedicine in Canada. Um, but a lot of things move very slowly to the point where you're often behind. So the client is trying to keep up. They're trying to manage the budget. It's our job to say, well, in your future, I think you're heading this direction. You need to be ahead of it. Uh, I'd rather see a client actually put a feature in in advance and be the, one of the first uh, as opposed to following everyone else. So in, in a competitive you know, market for talent, you really have to have those highlights of saying we're the first to do this or you know, early on adopters of this feature. And that gets attention, right? The, the old benefit models don't. So. Um, so yeah, that would be an, a, a, a sort of a commentary on what clients struggle with in terms of like keeping up. Why not subscribe to the premium version of HR in Review? You'll get ad-free content, early and extra episodes and more. Even better, although it's the premium edition, it's absolutely free. Sign up at hrreview.co.uk slash podcast. Kind of as a follow up to that, I'd, I'd love to sort of explore a bit more about that relationship that, that you know your average group benefits broker has with or consultant has with uh, the, the HR department. So from your experience, uh, from from your from your career, what, what kind of expectations do most HR folk have in dealing with a group benefits broker or consultant? And maybe as part of that answer, you could also suggest what services and products they, they expect to get. Mm. I think the old school model was that a broker was a very silent partner. <laughs> they would bring the product to the table and then say, let me know if you need anything. Uh, otherwise, I'll see you once a year with the renewal. Um, and clients in the past would have, okay, I guess that's what this is all about. There was a commission being paid somewhere behind the scenes, but nobody knew what it was. Now, I think the expectations are higher in that 
they want more value and support around the plan. At least, again, that's a, I'm biased because I believe that that's what they need and they deserve. Um, so I think expectations were traditionally very low. Uh, in fact, they never even measured their broker for what they're getting in terms of business value. Now, in terms of services and things that they should get, they really need to get a lot of learning. I, I, I believe that it's not as much about product. There's tons of product that, yes, has to be uh, investigated. You know, where does it fit? How do you compare the products and vendors? Um, but the service is in the advice and the counsel and the education. And that has to be all the time, not just when the client puts up their hand and says, have you heard of this? No, we have to be actually teaching them all the way along. Uh, and that could be design. That could be new ideas around administration of the plan, financial forecasting and risk around cost. Um, we spend a ton of time on communication. So it's different tools the employees should be you know, using how to raise the bar on employee understanding of the plan, appreciation of the plan. So it's at the end of the day, it's hands on. Like it really, they should be getting attention. They should be getting time with their broker. And to me, if they're not, then it's really a reason to rethink whether they're with the right broker or not. Okay, thank you. And how often do HR directors evaluate their benefits programs then? And if they wanted to, how, how might they do that to determine if it is as, as effective as it can be? And, and do, you, do you often agree with their approaches to, to that evaluation? Well, I guess the old school cadence was once a year visits. And um, now it's about monitoring and forecasting we literally talk to our clients on a quarterly basis. Uh, we have a mid-year review meeting and an annual review meeting. And then we have sessions with employees throughout the year to educate them on the grand offering of the plan or particular specific areas, if, if it's, say, mental health related. Um, so I would say that um, you know it has to be a lot more than it is traditionally. Um, and HR people probably, if they haven't experienced a really proactive, ongoing uh, relationship with their broker, um, they should look at models that are more active as an automatic service model, not as a at request. So um, you shouldn't be calling your broker, asking them things. They should be coming to you directly with, here are the latest ideas, trends, forecasts, benchmarking um, things. Um, you should get that automatically. Um, so that's, that would be what I would say to that question. Did I answer that for you? <laughs> yeah, I think, I, I, yeah. I think you did. I think you did. Thank okay. You. Uh, let, let's talk a little bit about ROI, return on investment. It's a term that's that used in lots of, uh, ways to evaluate the benefits of a company's group benefits plans mm -hmm. in, in, in the context of, of benefits then how is, how is ROI defined? Is mm -hmm. it, is it defined differently to, you know, to other HR metrics, for example? Yeah, it's a little harder sometimes to look at a benefit plan and know how that benefit plan is impacting, say, attraction or retention, right? We certainly want to be asking our employees about how important the plan is. Do they understand it? Do they appreciate it? Um, so surveys uh, are key in terms of measuring employee experience, right? The, the key question is sort of like, you know, would you leave this benefit plan for a better one at another company or often people actually say that wellness needs to be a part and they would leave your company if if they could find a similar job but with a wellness offering um, and we could talk about what real wellness offering should be but um, so ROI to us is measuring the employee experience and that again can be survey data response um, it could be a vibe of my employees actually come to me and tell us, tell me that they actually really like the plan. Um, that doesn't happen a lot. <laughs> and then finally, I guess there's a feeling from the leadership team, whether it's HR and finance people that say, um, I'm getting a lot of value out of this uh, as, a, as a terms of support around it. Um, because if the HR professional feels supported in how they manage benefits, they feel a lot more confident that they're delivering to the employee the best they can they can offer, um, and they become the hero. And we use that analogy a lot. 
is we want the HR pro to look like a hero in the eyes of the employee and the, the rest of the leadership team, right? Um, and we directly speak to HR people all the time about how we can help them feel better, look better. And uh, early on in a lot of their mandates in this first six months or a year of their um, position, they're looking for wins, right? They're looking for a way to make an impression. And frankly, benefits is sometimes the low hanging fruit that can be improved so drastically that it's like, look what I was able to do, right? So um, that's appealing. I'm, I'm sure to your listeners, like they're looking for ways to validate their existence. And as junior HR people, you know, if they can learn how to contribute to the, the benefit outcome, ROI, you know, they're going to get noticed. Uh, say if you're with a, an HR team of five or six people, then you certainly want to find a way to make an impact or, or demonstrate your, your ability. So again, ROI to me is measured on employee experience and then on the leadership team's feeling and confidence level. And just a point of definition there, low-hanging fruit listeners. I think that's a term that I first heard when I moved over to Canada. So low-hanging yeah. fruit means uh, e easier wins. Yes. Uh, may maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it's a common usage in the UK as well. But I believe I came across that term first when I when I moved to Canada. There we go. <laughs> um, okay, uh, we're coming towards the end of this interview. Just a few more questions for you. The next couple are standard questions that we ask of all of our guests. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. And the next one, I'm going to challenge you to answer in one minute or less. Oh, no, Bill, don't do that to me. Um, OK, so if you could pass on one crucial lesson that you've learned in your career, uh, what would be your your top tip for HR professionals in one minute or less? Wow, I, I think uh, the best investment that anyone can make with their team uh, for performance reasons is spending quality time with people. Um, you know, the days of performance reviews being done once a year or twice a year. Now, I think if you are a leader, um, either you in HR or your managers that work um, uh, with you, the more they can spend quality time one-to-one -one with their employees, mentoring, listening, supporting, uh, I think that is absolutely the biggest thing we can do. Now, we can't, one person can't do hundreds of these on a quarterly basis, but you can train your managers to spend and asking the right questions in those meetings. So to me, that's the number one investment that they could make. Rock and roll. That was about 50 seconds, Roger. Good work. OK. Um, OK, this next one, you can take a bit more time if you like. Uh, what is the single biggest change that you think will happen in human resources over the next five to 10 years? Yeah, to me, it's the change in how we measure uh, employee labor, and that is going to move towards more output versus time. And, um, you know, you can read all you want about flex time and um, different models for how employees work, include like vacation, paid time off, all these things. But truly, I think the most satisfied, the most autonomous worker is the one that feels that they have control um, and opportunity to improve how they manage their output, not how off, how long they work or what days they work. It's more about um, do they get that job done? Now, I, I'm speaking more about the knowledge worker. Obviously, in a manufacturing arrangement, you're dealing more with, you know, you know, physical labor, uh, time on. But um, I see really a movement um, towards output um, and uh, doing that in a healthy manner. So no longer can we just, you know, tell an employee to, uh, to just work more and more and more, push, push, push. Everyone is now saying that they're not really happy to do that anymore. And they may do it, but eventually they're going to leave, whether it's burnout or whether they just say, that's not for me. Employees uh, really value their lifestyle and their health. And uh, employers who uh, embrace that to me and get ahead of that by moving towards a measurement of output and productivity that can include technology, automation, efficiency. Uh, I think that's where employees will come to work. That's the way I'm building my business. Um, and I think that's one of the biggest change. The pandemic has fast forwarded that. But I think over the next five to 10 years, the most successful companies will 
be really creating very powerful auto, uh, autonomous empowered in people um, and that uh, that should make a huge difference in terms of competitive advantage for a business so yeah that would be my guess over five to ten years okay okay thank you very much and just finally i always like to ask my guests how folks can connect with them well i, I know a lot of the answers to this one so i might i might help you out here uh, because you and i have done things together